Boozed and Confused is a comedy and weird topic podcast. Adult language may be used probably by me. While our episode topics may be educational in nature, we are not responsible if your children start dropping the F-bomb to their kindergarten class. Listener discretion is advised. everybody take two hey <laughs> i'm carol ann i'm matt and this i'm is, holding the baby this is boost and confused and this is the second time we're doing this intro it turns out i i don't know we've been doing this for almost a year and somehow i've messed up the the recording of the intro so welcome back to another episode welcome back to take two yeah you've got a me episode today so if you can't stand the sound of my voice See you next week. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't even have a computer open. I'm just kind of flying blind. Um, all righty. Yeah. So this might actually be a two-parter. We'll see how far we get into the episode. But um, some housekeeping items before we get into today's topic. Uh, we are on all your favorite social media, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Um, I always appreciate the stuff that you guys send us and, and tag us in. So keep doing what you're doing. It's always great. I know I'm usually a couple days late, but I'm starting to get more active. Uh, Hopefully that continues. We'll see how how good that goes. Um, If you don't have social media and that's not really your thing and you want to send us an email of, I don't know, you want to email us memes, that's cool. Uh, You could also email us like creepy stories and stuff. Uh, We can be reached at boozedandconfusedpodcast at gmail.com. And uh, if you like the pod and you want to support us, uh, make sure, one, you just tune in every week, obviously, um, but also follow or subscribe wherever you listen to your podcasts. And if you want to take it a step further, the best thing that you could do to support us is leave us a review on your platform of choice, especially if it's Apple Podcasts. I know I say this every week. Uh, But it really does make a difference for other people to be able to find us, and it is totally free, and it takes maybe like 30 seconds of your time, and it's super appreciated. Um, The cool thing about leaving us a review is if you take a screenshot of the review and you send it to us, we will send you some boozed and confused stickers for free to you. Yeah, I just think they're neat. We have a lot. They are neat. (laughs) We're we're under the 3,000 mark maybe at this point, so you hear any um it's the baby baby. (laughs) sorry it's the executive producer yeah it's the the executive producer yeah yeah Yeah, she's got a lot to say it's gonna be nap time soon so we'll see how that goes Hmm. um all right and the last housekeeping item what are you drinking well we are still working on (laughs) the stone brewing um like combo pack from costco shout out to costco costco would make so much more money if they um let you drink while you were shopping get a dollar fifty hot dog and then and then a beer oh that'd be great i could spend the whole day there and they had like a like a sushi section like a live oh yeah yeah section and they would do it right Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm I'm drinking the Tangerine Express Hazy IPA. Uh huh. Very hoppy, very tangerine-ish. Um, not gonna lie though, I'm a little IPA'd out. Um, yeah. Really can go for like a Guinness right now. Uh, but the fridge in the garage is chock full of all that. Uh, Ooh, high quality Miller Lite. Miller Lite, Coors Light. Oh yeah. Uh, uh, old, old style. style. Mm. I would really love to get one of those old, um, old style signs that all the bars have. Like, oh, you mean the, the original city. Chicago flag? <laughs> I would love to have that as the Chicago like sigil. Yeah, that'd be dope. Yeah, that'd be good. Um, I am also drinking a beer. It is also by Stone Brewing, and it's Buena Vesa. It's a salt and lime lager. It's delicious. It's actually. Um, a little bit different than you know like a traditional lager so it's pretty good yeah it's it's like you put salt and lime in a lager yeah that's actually 
exactly it. There you go. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, we're going to get into today's topic again. Might be a two-parter. We'll see how it goes. Um, but yeah. Yeah. Last we talked, um, you were talking about um, avocado cartels. Yeah. And then you were like, nah, I'm not doing that. I, I found this in So originally we were going to talk about avocado cartels and how um, lucrative the avocado business has become to drug cartels. Um, do you know why it's become lucrative? Well, yes. Middle-aged white women going to brunch. Yeah. Thanks, Karen, going to fucking Foxtrot downtown to get your $15 avocado toast. Bottomless mimosas. <laughs> um, yeah, no, just kidding. Um, maybe I'll pick up the avocado cartel story for another day, but I thought this one was much more interesting, so we're just going to roll with it. Well, I do love avocado. I don't. I like guacamole, though. You just got to add stuff to it. All right. So without further ado, let's get into today's topic before the executive producer starts to wake up. Yeah, I don't even know what it is. <laughs> um, so we don't usually talk about true crime stuff. And um, I know that we've had some instances in the past where I think maybe Matt's a changed man after uh, having a child. Um, some of the true crime stuff maybe just hits a little bit too close to home or it's like too, I don't know real it's the recent ones yeah it's the yeah, ones that are like still fresh and you know what no i i will say while i was doing lawn stuff um i've listened to two podcasts yeah one was murder in illinois uh-huh uh, which happened in 2007 mm -hmm. and the other one it's like oh what what is that one called i Piketon liked that one oh yeah massacre that was 2016 yeah pike to massacre is great i've only listened to the first episode with you but that, i really liked it that might not be the name but that's the topic something like that yeah both are like gruesome um like family kills like brutal are you feeling inspired but i'm <laughs> am i feeling inspired <laughs> no no F fbi guy no not at all no i'm just trying uh... to I'm trying to get back into like listening to podcasts. Yeah, I, same. I it's haven't hard. in the longest time. Yeah. I'll besides uh, the uh, not another D and D podcast. Yeah. That one's really fun. Yeah, I try to listen to pods um, when I'm taking my like little coffee walks with the baby. This week, I actually listened to Hollow Sky podcast. Love those guys. If you haven't checked them out yet, highly recommend that you do. Um, they also just talk about like weird and creepy shit. So. Um, they're great and they just have great banter and they're hysterical. So highly do, recommend. Do they have a baby? They, I, they don't have a baby, <laughs> but, um, at least not together. <laughs> they should invest <laughs> in getting a baby producer. Yeah. I'll make the recommendation to them. They're, or guys, if you listen, I hope you, <laughs> I hope you hear that. <laughs> they're brutally honest and they really improve the show. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, um, however, today's topic is like far enough in the past. I think it's a little bit more comfortable to talk about. So, um, it's a little less like true crime and more, I don't know, disappearance or mystery, I guess you could maybe say. So uh, today we're talking about the Sodder family disappearance. Um, it's not really the whole family. It's like five of the kids. Um, but there's just a lot to really impact. So we're going to get right into it. Let's go. So George and Jenny Sodder lived in Fayetteville, West, Fayetteville, West Virginia with their 10 kids. Right. And ten. yeah, 10 kids. Um, and they're both immigrants from Italy. And this is actually a very cute story of how they met. Um, he, like, walked into this local store one day called The Music Box and met the owner's daughter. And that happened to be Jenny. Um, so they were, like, very well-respected um, middle-class family. They were well-known in the area. And so the night before Christmas, uh, it's 1945, the family goes to sleep, minus, like, one son who's away at the military at this point. Um, so minus that one son that's gone, we'll do a quick roll call of the kids who are around. Um, so there's Sylvia, who's the youngest. She's two. Um, there's Marion, who's 17. John is 23. George Jr., who's 16. Maurice is 14. Martha is 12. Um, Lewis is nine. Jenny, not to be confused with the mother, but like think of her as like a Jenny Jr., um, who's eight, and Betty, who is five. That's a wild spread. Yeah. 26. Yeah. No, no, no. 23 is the oh, oldest, oldest. and two is the two. youngest. Yeah. 
That's a massive spread. Very large spread. Yeah. Very impressive. Yeah. Um, no interest. Yeah. <laughs> no interest in doing that. Um, we always laugh because we're on the south side of Chicago, and a lot of the like Irish Catholic families would have just shitloads of kids. So many kids. Um, and my mom's family was considered the youngest or not the youngest sorry the smallest on the block with five kids um whereas a lot of the other families had like eight plus and that was pretty normal so no thanks i'm good with this one for now um maybe we'll add another cat and then uh we'll like maybe have another kid you mean dog no 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 you mean a dog no dogs are a lot of work babies are a lot of work well yeah but we're gonna get a dog one day you're gonna come home and there's gonna be a dog No, no no you can't you can't do that to me. Only I can do that to you. <laughs> no, no, that's uh, that's not how this works. All right. So anyways, back to uh, the Sauter children. So um, unfortunately, a fire breaks out around one o'clock in the morning. Four of the kids happen to escape with their parents. So that would be Sylvia, Marion, John, and George Jr. Um, the other five kids are nowhere to be found. So that would be Maurice, Martha, Louis, Jenny, and Betty. Um, George pretty much breaks back into the house, like thinking that the kids are still there, tries to rescue them. Uh, when he gets back into the house, the fire is just like absolutely like raging throughout the entire house. It's just tearing things down. The entire downstairs at this point, um, including the living room and dining room, the kitchen, the office and his room are already completely gone. And so he's thinking that, um, you know, Maurice, Martha, Louis, Jenny, and Betty were upstairs somewhere hiding, um, but he couldn't get there because, unfortunately, the staircase was already on fire. Um, So as you can imagine, obviously, I think back then as well, um, probably like an old school wooden house is my guess, Uh, probably went up pretty quick. So... Um, George always kept a ladder propped up against the house outside, so he ran to where he would keep the ladder, thinking that he could reach the kids through the upstairs windows. Um, So he gets there, and it's missing. The ladder is just gone. And so he goes, okay, well, plan B. Um, He, you know, would take one of his trucks that's close enough to the house um, that he could climb on it and reach the windows. However, both trucks worked the day prior and suddenly would not start at all. So, uh, Marion, who's one of the the daughters, goes to a neighbor's house for help. They try to call the fire department and there's no operator response. And a neighbor sees the fire happening, calls from a tavern nearby, no operator response. So the neighbor ends up driving into town to find this fire chief, and his name is Morris. Um, And the fire chief starts this phone tree, basically, where, like, the firemen all call one another. So, like, fireman A calls fireman B, fireman B calls fireman C. Um, You know, it kind of goes on from there. Very old school. Yeah, it doesn't seem very uh, conducive to being quick. Yeah, no, no, absolutely not. Um, so the fire department is like less than three miles away from the Sauter home and they don't get there until eight o'clock in the morning. So the fire starts like round one-ish, you would say. They don't show up until eight. And at this point, there's like obviously nothing left of the house. I don't know, like even by today's construction standards, I don't know that anything would still be left if it had burned, you know, um, for that long. But, um, you know, so like anyone would pretty reasonably think George and Jenny thought that their kids were dead. Um, There's a search done of the grounds and there's no remains found at all. And the fire chief says, well, you know, maybe the fire is hot enough that it just cremated the, Mm -hmm. the remains. All right. I'm not an expert. I work in digital marketing for a reason. Um, I don't know how hot a fire has to be to burn a body like that and for the sake of like not being put on a list I'm not going to google it <laughs> myself um, but this investigation is being done and this like fire is being attributed to faulty wiring and so George decides that he's going to cover the basement with like five feet of dirt to preserve it as a memorial so pretty much any sort of like crime scene or anything that was there he just absolutely like um, destroyed it's a perfect crime. Yeah. So, 
here's the thing. The death certificates are written as fire or suffocation as the causes. And one thing that I do know is um, usually in, like, house fires, it's not that somebody's, like, burning to death inside and that's how they they die it's usually they'll they'll die from like the smoke inhalation first which I don't know if that's a a better way to think about it like it's maybe a little more peaceful that somebody's not just on fire alive I don't know I don't know I I would prefer to maybe go from smoke inhalation in my sleep but yeah so kind of sounds like this is where the story should end right Um, but no, there's some really shady, weird, creepy shit that we're going to talk about. There's a lot of, this story had me going in circles and I'm going to be honest. I started this story with one opinion, kind of knowing the facts. And then I did a lot more digging. Uh, my opinion actually completely changed. So I would be curious to know what other people think. Um, so first we're going to talk about George. So something to keep in the back of your minds as we go through all of this is how we talked about him immigrating to the U.S. from Italy. So he came here in 1908. He was 13 and his older brother came with, like dropped him off at Ellis Island and then was like, peace, (laughs) went back to Italy. Um, So from there, George was pretty much on his own to find work and it eventually turned to him starting his own business, which was a trucking company. Um, They specialized in like hauling if you... um, you know, want to keep that in the back of the mind. George never really talked about why he came over from Italy. I, you know, I I guess maybe leave that to your mind. So we're going to fast forward to 1945, which is the year of the fire. The first weird incident that happens. The stranger comes to the house under the guise of like discussing hauling work, right? And somehow they like you know, I don't know if it's like two two dads talking, you know, where it's like, <laughs> like, oh, yeah, I see this right here, this gutter, you know, maybe you start talking about like housework or like projects or something. They somehow make their way to the back of the house and the stranger points to the fuse boxes and says like, this is going to cause a fire someday. And George was thinking it was incredibly strange um, and like sketchy. That, um, you know, this guy would say this because he actually had a local power company recently check it um, and say that it was fine and it met standards. So kind of interesting. Um, So a second weird incident within a similar time frame, a man shows up trying to sell the family life insurance and the guy gets pissed when George says no and says your goddamn house is going up in smoke and your children are going to be destroyed. Um, which is pretty weird and like oddly specific. And I'm maybe that's just like they got into an argument and the guy wasn't saying it as like a threat, but he was saying it more as like a you're gonna be sorry someday that you don't have life insurance. I don't know. Um, so he also says you are going to be paid dirty for the remarks. Sorry, you are going to be paid for the dirty remarks you have been making about Mussolini. Oh. 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 That guy. The plot thickens. Benito. So it turns out George was pretty loud and proud about his dislike for Mussolini. So much to the point where he would get in like public arguments with other members of the Italian community in their town. And you have to remember like back in the day when a lot of people were immigrating from their countries to the U.S., a lot of the times they would find like little communities of people from you know their same country so that's why you have like a little italy downtown you know um i know the south side of chicago like very irish at one point um chicago kind of has been like a melting pot if you call it that but um so you have a lot of italians who have come over to the u.s and have a lot of different opinions um about mussolini and If you think about politics these days and how divisive they can be, I'm sure it was just the same back then. You know, having having a a looser uh, grasp on world history, uh, but still having enough because you know I watched lots of History Channel. Ancient alien. You watch Ancient Aliens. I think Mussolini was uh, an alien. No, (laughs) no. Um, I picture Mussolini. as like Hitler's little like yes man 
He's like, ooh, I want to be a fascist too. <laughs> oh, I want to play. <laughs> I want to be just like you. Who is that guy, uh, the politician? Oh, Ted Cruz. Oh, my God. I see him as like Ted Cruz yeah. to, you know, uh, Hitler. To the Trump. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I could, I could see it. So, all right, there's a third weird incident that happens. The older boys in the Sutter family recall that right before Christmas, this, uh, this one to me is like the weirdest one maybe, um, a man was parked along U.S. Highway 21 nearby and was intently watching the younger kids when they came home from school. So, I don't know. I, I don't really know what to do with that one. It's just kind of weird. And then there's a fourth weird incident. Um, this one is closest to the fire. So 12.30 a.m. Christmas morning, everyone's asleep after opening a few presents. The phone rings. Jenny answers it. And there's a mysterious female voice asking for a name that Jenny has never heard of. So in the background, Jenny hears like laughing. There's glasses clinking. And Jenny finally tells the woman that they have the wrong number. So she starts to go back to bed and notices... Like, very strangely, all the downstairs lights were on, the curtains were open, the front door is unlocked, and sees Marion asleep on the couch in the living room. And from this, she kind of just assumes, like, the rest of the kids are asleep upstairs. Um, But as she's falling asleep, she hears a loud bang on the roof, followed by a rolling noise. Santa? It's not... It's not... Santa. I don't think... I don't think it was Santa. Are you sure? No, no, because the presents were already there. Maybe, maybe he, maybe he came back. Be. This is like his MO. <laughs> so an hour away, an hour later, she's awake again. Um, but this time she's woken up by smoke filling up her bedroom. And at this point, obviously, the, the fire, fire had, you know, already started. So these are all like pretty weird things that happened before the fire. Um, let's talk about the weird shit that kind of followed. Jenny pretty much refused to believe that the kids died in the fire and like didn't leave a single trace of bones so she starts to experiment on her own to like test out this theory she's not turning into um like a serial killer or anything she's using like chicken bones beef joints pork chop bones and kind of just reacting to see or kind of testing to see how they react to fire um so instead of finding like absolutely nothing she finds that the bones are charred which would kind of insinuate in her mind, that there would at least be bones left right. at the, the scene. Right. Normally, um, from my experience, when you burn things, they burn. <laughs> when you light things on fire. They, they burn. <laughs> they burn. I'm so glad we have a fire expert on the pod today. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's it. Uh, Great. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So... Jenny also talks to an employee at a crematorium, and she finds out that bones remain after bodies are burned for about two hours at 2,000 degrees. And um, she says, well, that doesn't make sense because our house was gone in like 45 minutes. So how is it possible that the bones were cremated that quickly in the home? That's not all. So a phone repairman um, comes to the house, tells the family that their lines weren't burned, they were cut. Oh, yes. I legit thought you were going to say, like, the guy came to fix their phone line and then he was like, hey, where's the house? <laughs> no, no. Um, So the cause of the fire was supposedly like faulty wiring. So if that's really the case, the power would have been dead now mm-hmm. and the lighted downstairs rooms would not have been a thing. OK, so kind of strange. It continues. A witness comes forward and allegedly saw a man at the fire scene taking a block and tackle that was used for removing car engines. So remember those cars that wouldn't start. Also, I think depending on like what story you listen to, um, it sounds like it overlaps with the time that the house is actually already on fire, but nobody's out yet. So it's like this guy is stealing stuff. The house is on fire. Like that, like who the fuck does? It? Like you have to be a huge trash human being to do that. If you are gonna steal something, you want a big distraction, and I think a fire would be a great distraction. Yeah, yeah, it would be. That would that would be a good one. Like even if I were caught, 
I'd be like, hey, I'm your neighbor. I'm helping you, helping you get <laughs> yeah. stuff out of the house. Yeah, well, I was just coming to see you. You know your house is on fire? <laughs> so there's more. Remember that, like, thing that Jenny heard hit the roof and then kind of roll? Santa. Not, not Santa. His so, elves. So the family is visiting the site, and Sylvia finds a hard rubber object laying in the yard. And George con- concludes it was a napalm pineapple bomb of the type used in warfare. Napalm. And if that wasn't bad enough, post-fire, then roll in the sightings of the kids. You know, I feel like this this happens after, like, every, like, abduction, loose quotes, abduction, where there's always, like, f- sightings that people claim to have seen and... Um, I'm sure that's very hard to work through as, uh, you know, a professional in that field. So some of the claims that um, were made of the sightings were um, a woman supposedly saw the missing children peering from a passing car while the fire was blazing. Um, A different woman who operates a tourist stop between Fayetteville and Charleston, which is about 50 miles west, um, said she saw the children the morning after the fire. Um, you know, she alleges that she served them breakfast, that there was a car with Florida license plates, plates at the, the, you know, tourist court. Um, a third woman claims to have seen four of the five kids a week after the fire, only realized it though, after she saw their photos in a newspaper. So she saw the kids really didn't think anything of it and then saw the newspaper that, um, you know, had their photos and then decided to make a call. So she says that the kids were accompanied by two men and two women, all Italian. And this is a quote from her. I do not remember the exact date. However, the entire party did register at the hotel and stayed in a large room with several beds. They registered about midnight. I talked, tried to talk to the children in a friendly manner, but the men appeared hostile and refused to allow me to talk to these children. One of the men looked me looked at me in a hostile manner he turned around and began talking rapidly in italian immediately the whole party stopped talking to me i sensed that i was being frozen out so i said nothing more they left early the next morning okay there's a lot here so you're george and jenny um you're probably trying to like mourn grieve like move forward figure out like what the hell happened um, and you just like don't have any actual closure. You don't have any bones. You you hear all these sightings that are coming through. So what do you do? You know, like I don't know what I would do if that were me in that situation. I probably wouldn't want to accept that they were possibly dead either. You know. So in 1947, they send a letter to the FBI, pretty much asking for help. And the FBI comes back and says, "Well, we can help if." your local authorities in Fayetteville give us the okay. Because in their minds, it's like a local issue. The FBI doesn't really have jurisdiction there. Um, the local authorities say no. So George and Jenny don't want to give up yet. I probably wouldn't either. Um, so they hire a PI named C.C. Tinsley. And Tinsley finds some kind of weird shit. So let's go back to the insurance salesman. It turns out he was a member of the coroner's jury that claimed the fire was accidental. I don't believe that that was ever really brought out into the open during all of this. uh, Because that seems like it would be probably a conflict of interest. Um, Let's talk about the fire chief Morris. So there was a story, well, we'll call it, from a local minister about the fire chief. Um, And the minister alleges that the chief confided that he had discovered a heart in the ashes, but hid it inside of a dynamite box and then buried it at the scene. Uh, How would you find a heart? I don't know. Okay. Yeah, right? There's a lot of questions there, right? So the investigator turns to the chief and asks to be shown the spot. And they go together. They uncover the heart. They take it to the funeral director, who says this is not a heart (laughs) it was beef liver and it was not at all touched by the fire okay so there's more rumors that come from this that like that pretty much brings up more questions than answers for the Sauter family and the family hears that the chief had allegedly told others that he buried the beef liver 
um, beef liver (laughs) in the hope that the family would find the remains and, like, just stop the investigation. Basically, like, here is a, you know, pretend this is a human heart. Uh, You don't have to look anymore. They definitely died here. Don't you worry. That's some shoddy work. Yeah, right. Very shoddy. Yeah. So this shit goes on for years, like like tips and leads and stories and rumors. So August 1949 rolls around, and the Sauter family has a new search at the scene of their old house, um, but brings in a Washington, D.C. pathologist named Oscar B. Hunter. This is my side note. I feel like that long after the incident... Plus, knowing that George basically bulldozed the entire house and then, like, contaminated the entire scene, I don't really know what they were expecting to find, um, given that anything that would have been, you know, helpful is, like, four or five feet under the ground. And now it's, like, what, four years later? So, yeah. So, there's, like, this thorough excavation that um, Oscar B. Hunter does, and they find, like, damaged coins, a partly burnt dictionary, and several shards of vertebrae. Oh. So, Hunter sends the bones to the Smithsonian Institution, which comes back with this report. All right, this whole next part I'm going to do is a quote from the report. Um, The human bones consist of four lumbar vertebrae belonging to one individual. Since the transverse recesses are fused, the age of this individual at death should have been 16 or 17 years. The top limit of age should be about 22 since the centra, which normally fuse at 23, are still unfused. On this basis, the bones show greater skeletal um, maturation uh, than one would expect for a 14-year-old boy, the oldest missing solder child. It is, however, possible, although not probable, for a boy, a boy 14 and a half years to show 16 to 17 maturation. Um, I'm sorry, a lot of my direct quotes today, I'm apparently having trouble reading. But, okay, so we'll add in some more weird shit. The vertebrae had no fire damage at all. So, some other tidbits from the report. Quote, it is very strange that no other bones were found in the allegedly careful evacuation of the basement of the house. And, quote, one would expect to find the full skeletons of the five children rather than only four vertebrae of one child. Mm -hmm. Um, Especially given that they say the house only burned for 30 to 45 minutes, according to them. So, they concluded the vertebrae probably came in the supply of dirt that George used to fill in the basement to create the memorial for his kids. Which, like, is also just strange in itself. You have, like, a supply of dirt and it just has random human bones in there. (laughs) I kind of expect that in dirt, though. Human bones? When I was a kid and I was, like, in my backyard digging, I was looking for bones. Did you ever find any? I thought I did. Yeah. Just rocks. Yeah, just rocks. But not bones. Yeah, no. Mm-mm. So, right, the Smithsonian report comes out, and as a result, there's two hearings at the Capitol in Charleston. And the governor, um, Oki L. Patterson, uh, and the state police superintendent, W.E. Burchett, tells the Sodders basically to give up, like, case, case closed, your kids died in the fire, you know, your search is hopeless, you're done, Um, and literally closes the case. So George and Jenny basically say, fuck you, (laughs) Uh, we're not done, and they have this billboard that's put up along Route 16, and they start handing out flyers offering like a $5,000 reward for info that would lead to the recovery of the kids. And this billboard stayed up for like decades um, I was reading stories of people who said, like, it, it pretty much stayed up until Jenny died, but, um, you know, it was like an ominous sort of thing when you're driving into town and you see this billboard of the five kids, and it had been up for so long. So the 5K wasn't enough. Um, you know, they increase it to 10K, and they start getting more tips in, of course. And George would always travel the country to investigate each lead and always came up empty handed for all of these, which like, it, like, I don't know. It's kind of sad. Um, you know, we're going to fast forward. So it's 1968 now. Fire happened in 1945. Do the math. Jenny gets the mail 
and finds an envelope addressed only to her. And it's postmarked in Kentucky. There's no return address. And she finds a picture of a guy who looks like he's in his mid-20s, and there's a message on the back. Louis Sauter. I love Brother Frankie. Um, I think this says, like, Illy Boys. Um, followed by A90132 or 35. Okay. They find that the picture looks a lot like their son, Louis. You know, despite him being only nine at the time, there's, like, a lot of similarities to, like, facial structure. Mm -hmm. So they hire another PI. They send him to Kentucky. And they never hear from him again. So, like, what a jag off, first of all. Because that reminds me of the psychics, you know, loose quotes around the word psychics who try to, like, exploit grieving families where it's like, you know, oh, your missing child has been gone for 23 years. I see a boat. I see water, you know. But, like, they don't see shit because they're just exploiting families who are desperate for answers. So... Uh, Jenny and George update the billboard with the updated picture that they got that they believe to be Lewis. And they didn't include like the note or anything on the back because they felt that it would potentially put Lewis in danger um, if they included any of those details. So they just just included the picture. So George dies in 1968. He has no closure for what actually happened to his children, which is pretty sad. And Jenny doesn't take the death well. Um, she builds a fence around the property. She's, like, exclusively wearing black, you know, in, in every, like, public sighting. Um, and literally only wore black until she passed away in 1989. So, George dies in 1968. Jenny passes away in 1989. That's a big gap. So, after both passed, the billboard finally came down. It had been up for a long time. And... The surviving children and their children, so basically like George and Jenny's grandchildren at this point, keep looking for the truth. Um, there are some theories that they had. So the first is that the local mafia had tried to recruit him and he declined. Um, they tried to extort money from him and he refused. Um, or that the children were kidnapped by someone that they knew, someone who, you know, burst into the unlocked front door, told them about the fire, and offered to take them someplace safe. Um, you know, they may not have survived the night, and if they had, they, you know, and if they lived for decades, it was Lewis in that photograph. Um, you know, the theory would be that they didn't contact their parents because they wanted to protect them mm -hmm. from whatever, you know, it is. So... Sylvia Sauter, who was the youngest at two at the time of the fire, was the last Sauter family, uh, last of the Sauter family to pass away. And unfortunately, she actually died this year. She died April 21st in 2021. Wow, that so, just happened. Yeah. So before her death, she actually would visit like crime sleuthing websites um, and engage with people who were still interested in the Sauter family mystery. And she was always looking for tips and mm -hmm. and you know theories um because she did not believe that her siblings perished in the fire and that is where i originally ended today's episode and it didn't feel a lot of my information came from a few sources and it didn't feel like i was doing my due diligence because it feels very here's the facts one sided and here's like you know the kids definitely didn't die in the fire so I wanted to add some like other perspectives or like points of view and and do a little bit more like fact checking on things um, so people can come to their own conclusions with all of the thoughts around this. So if you're thinking that there's definitely foul play here, because that was my opinion when I first started this, let me add in some facts that might give you a new perspective. We're going to start with John, who's the one of the children who survived. In his first police interview after the fire, he stated that he went up to the attic to grab his siblings who were sleeping, and that he, like, physically shook them. And later on, John changes the story to say that he only called up there and didn't actually see them. So, did John change his story because he was ashamed that he couldn't save his siblings? Was he influenced by his parents' insistence that, you know, anything could have happened to the children other than that they died in the fire? Um, 
you know, and after the fire, John seems to be the only Sauter family member who believes the five children actually died in the fire. So my thinking around that is probably like he did actually try to go save the kids upstairs. But if you remember the conversation around smoke inhalation, it's possible that they were already dead um, by the time that he got up there and couldn't save them. And it like maybe John was suffering from like survivor's guilt or, you know, that he couldn't do anything. Um, But I also have to imagine like being John's age and your parents are so hell bent on finding an answer outside of one that was already presented to you um, maybe would have influenced his decision to say, oh, I, I didn't actually see them. I only called upstairs, you know. I don't know. What do you think? Um. Yeah, I mean, it seems very plausible that uh, finding the uh, siblings all, you know, deceased from the inhalation, or at least passed out, mm-hmm. and then kind of like knowing how like hell bent the parents are, yeah, just avoiding the situation and and just you know letting yeah. them do the thing that they've been doing, yeah, yeah. So there's this other question that's like kind of unanswered, which is if the children were kidnapped, how were the five kids kidnapped without anyone really knowing? So we're going to move on to the fire department. It might seem really sketchy that the fire was like somewhere around 1 a.m. They didn't show up until around 8 a.m. But I want to give some some thoughts around this. And I these are actually not my original thoughts. I ended up on this Reddit thread that had great conversation about it. There's a a subreddit called Unsolved Mysteries, and I highly recommend checking it out if you're a Redditor and you like these kinds of things. Um, There's a lot of really good stories from there. So um, someone starts to point out some some things around the fire department and maybe why it's not as sketchy seeming as it appears to be. Um, you know, so first it's a volunteer fire department, uh, which is not uncommon for that area. Um, it's probably safe to assume they were enjoying their Christmas holiday with their family. Um, you know, probably enjoying some alcoholic beverages. Um, and because of the location, it's pretty rural. Um, you know, and they're coming off of the depression and the war. They probably lacked a lot of resources. So, um, the other point of that is, uh, the fire chief could not drive the fire truck, um, which kind of seems like maybe a little bit weird, you know, like you should be able to, but, um, I guess back in the day, a lot of people didn't really necessarily have driver's licenses or weren't like really required to drive. So it may not have actually been super uncommon that, um, the fire chief couldn't drive the fire truck, you know, maybe he was just like a pencil pusher in an office i don't know oh i thought he was like slackered or something yeah no (laughs) no 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 i can't drive i've I've had too many eggnogs yeah (laughs) um so the other part uh that may seem a little bit sketchy is this whole fire investigation and that you know that there being no remains found um it's entirely possible that there is actually no malice involved. It was just run by a super unqualified department who completely botched it. And because George then covered everything up, um, you know, any evidence that they would have had uh, was just completely contaminated. And they, you know, kind of missed out Mm -hmm. on their opportunity there. So they really only searched for like two hours, which of course wouldn't really yield much. And an investigation like that these days would take days or possibly weeks to to find answers and that kind of brings us to the next point so it's claimed the fire only burned for 45 minutes however when the fire department did finally show up at eight o'clock the fire was still hot Mm -hmm. um, and they had to water things down before they could start the search which would indicate that it was still burning at the time that they got there so one thing that's kind of weird that like you would kind of assume would be talked about a little bit more. There's there's really two sides to this story, right? The first one is like, what happened to the children? The second is, how did the fire start in the first place? Um, for the latter question about how the fire started in the first place, there's someone that we haven't talked about, and he's not widely talked about in a lot of these stories, which is kind of strange because he seems like a prime suspect. But 
His name is Fiorenzo Genitolo. Um, he's a well-respected Italian businessman from Fayetteville. And there's some quick facts about him courtesy of this like fantastic Reddit post. And I'll link it in the show notes. There's a lot of really good comments and discussion. Um, so he's the director of Fayette uh, County National Bank, which he inherited from his father. And he was the co-signer on a loan to George and a listed recipient of a $1,500 insurance policy and a mortgage clause on the Sodder's property. Ooh, a little bit of a conflict of interest there. So fifteen hundred back then is about twenty thousand in today's dollars. Okay, that's a lot of money. So he also owned a hauling company where George had previously worked uh, before George started his own business, and uh, it was called the Janitolo Construction Company. Um, he worked with his cousin and business partner, a uh, client, Janitolo. Uh, who was on the coroner's jury, which nobody also talked about. There's a lot of conflict of interest here. Yeah, this is getting a little fishy now. I feel like a lot of this is just, like, small-town politic bullshit that, mm-hmm. like, you you know, you just get away with because it's a small town. Um, he also may have been irritated that the Sodders hadn't settled the estate of Jenny's deceased father. And um, there are actually some sources that report it was him and not the guy named long the insurance uh salesman who threatened george um but most of the sources actually list genitolo or not genitolo long uh as the man who threatened him so that one is kind of dodgy but he definitely had motive to start the fire which is kind of shocking because like a lot of things align uh in favor of him being the prime suspect but he's like really not talked about anywhere And it's not known if he was actually investigated for it or not. The part that I find to be very strange is the family never really name dropped him as someone that they wanted investigated or that they thought to be a suspect. So either it didn't cross their mind, they didn't think that he would have any involvement, or he was actually investigated and they didn't really find anything, you know. So I have a lot of questions. Those are like the main facts that I have. And I think there's a lot of like little things that come up here and there. Um, so if I missed anything, I apologize. Um, I feel like this could be an entire podcast on its own, (laughs) kind of just going through like a lot of the interviews and, um, you know, like talking to family members and, and things like that. But, um, the questions that I have, what started the fire at the Sutter home that night to begin with, if it wasn't faulty wiring and the phone lines were cut? Hmm. What happened to the Sodder children? I, so I originally went into this thinking that there was definitely foul play. However, you read a lot more about how maybe the family's facts didn't line up with the actual facts or, um, you know, you kind of like start thinking about how parents could potentially be so desperate for answers Mm -hmm. and they don't want to accept that their kids had actually passed away that they're willing to think about anything other than you know accepting the truth or potential truth um but is it possible that the kids were actually kidnapped um you know did they perish in the fire and the the investigation by the department was so poor that they just ruined any evidence or didn't find anything uh because they weren't trained i don't know i have a lot of questions um I would be curious to know what everybody else thinks. I feel like this can go either very simply put, it was just done wrong, or it goes super deep and it just keeps on going and now everyone's everyone's gone now. So. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, their kids are still around. The, you know, George and Jenny's grandkids are still around. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't really know if any of them are like active and, you know, still active and trying to figure out what had happened, but I don't know. I, I am of the belief it's possible that they died in the fire. Um, especially given John's account where he like changed it after the first interview, you know, and it's possible he like really just had, did have survivor's guilt. And like, he was also so young at the time that that happened that, you know, I don't know if I could live knowing that plus also like my parents really wouldn't accept it you know any any potential evidence showing that they died in the fire or maybe you know being young and he was threatened by somebody yeah to change his story yeah that's it, also it very that true way. yeah yeah i don't know do you have any other final thoughts or theories 
Uh, no, just that I'm going to check our um, <laughs> extinguishers and our uh, smoke detectors tonight. Yeah, I. Um, this is a good uh, reminder. Oh, the executive producer wants everyone to know that you should always check your uh, smoke detectors and replace your batteries twice a year. It's always a good time to do it at um, fall back and spring forward. So, yeah, I don't know. We Or also, you could be like us and uh, just be lazy and have the nest. What are they? Nest protect? Yeah. Smoke detectors. Yeah, the Google They guys. check themselves. <laughs> and then they send an alert to my phone telling me that they checked them. So, yeah. All right. So, this is not a two-part episode. Um, ended up just being one episode. Uh, almost an hour long. Usually, my episodes are a little bit shorter, but... For continuation's sake, I thought it was better to keep it together. Um, I don't know. Any other thoughts? No, it is. Uh, it's very interesting, though. It's very interesting. It's a. Uh, it reeks of, of a, uh, foul play, but, could also like equally just be like. Just really tragic. Yeah, yeah. I feel like. In terms of the children, I am currently leaning more towards that they unfortunately died in the fire. However, I feel like the part of the story that isn't talked about more is like, who the fuck started the fire in the first place? Like, that's the part that I want to dive more into. And there really wasn't a lot available on it. So, yeah, I don't know. That's kind of all I've got. Okay. Anything else from the other side of the table? No, no, I was uh, I was part of the audience today. <laughs> well, I would love to know what everybody else thinks about this case, and um, feel free to give us your thoughts on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter, um, or email us at boostingconfusedpodcast at gmail dot com if you just like completely hated it, um, or if you loved it, or you got some other ideas. Would love to know. So. That's all I've got for today. I know I did a lot of talking. I'm going to finish this beer up and I don't know, go take a walk outside or something. Yeah, I just feel like um, a crime, if this were a crime of this uh, size, would be damn near impossible to commit in this day and age. Oh, yeah, because everyone has like a Nest camera or like a ring or, you know. Or those guys from SVU come around. Uh, yeah. Dick yeah. Wolf solves it. Dick Wolf, you've done it again. I've done it again. All right, well, that's all I've got for today. I guess we will see you guys next week. Yeah, sounds good. All righty. Bye. Bye, y'all. <laughs> <laughs>